Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining in for the fall edition of CFIC's Conference for Inquiry 2021. I'm John Varghese, and as chair of the Communications Committee for the Center for Inquiry Canada, I'm privileged to take on this role of welcoming you all to this event. Next up, we have uh, Keith Douglas uh, exploring what is a computational theory of mind. He's celebrating 30 years of Daniel Dennett's Consciousness Explained. Keith was born in Montreal and studied philosophy and computing at McGill, the University of British Columbia, and Carnegie Mellon University. He still maintains a strong amateur interest in these fields and especially in their combination. He has been greatly influenced in these areas by the philosophy of Daniel Dennett and also enjoys discussing the merits of Dennett's work more generally. A Canadian federal public servant, his day job is in cybersecurity, particularly application security. Today, Keith will be exploring ideas about the computational theory of mind based on the work by Dennett, as well as Mario Bunge and Roger Penrose. For those of us, you that are just joining us, there will again be an opportunity for questions at the end of the talk. We will be collecting questions using the Zoom chat window, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be presenting the questions to our speaker at the end. Please keep your questions short and to the point. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get to every question. We may combine questions where appropriate. We've enabled access to the Zoom chat for all participants. We will use the Zoom chat to collect the questions and also for people to post about technical issues. For those who would prefer more informal discussion, we invite you to join the chat on Discord. The link is posted in the chat. In all cases, we expect participants to be respectful of the speakers and other audience members. This talk is being recorded for publication on your YouTube channel. If this is a concern for you, please turn off your video and or use a pseudonym. And I'll leave it to you now, Keith. Welcome. The full, ver the full version of the title is What a Computational Theory of Mind and What Are Some Scientifically Respectable Alternatives? This is more important because there are, there's a lot of disdain and I might say, lack of a better phrase, just gainsaying the idea. And uh, we're going to see whether we can find some uh, scientifically respectable alternatives to, to compare Dennett's view with in this talk. So outline here, I will introduce the talk in a bit more detail. I'll give a personal note to sort of situate this. Rule some things off topic, though we're welcome to talk about them later if you want to. Explain what computability theory is and why it matters for this topic, what other computational ideas might be. And then put Dennett in, you might say, extended conversation with my own teacher, Mary Bungay, um, and his erstwhile critic, Roger Penrose, and then conclude and take any questions that you might have. So, um, I, so I am taking the Argentinian physicist and philosopher of science, Mary Bungay, as the first tar target with Dennett, and then the physics, physicist and Nobel laureate, which came in just as I was, as I was first thinking about this talk a couple of years ago, Roger Penrose. There's many, many other people we one could think about in this context that have also influenced me and the debate. Dennett is on the slide because Dennett's book has an anniversary that people, there's a multiple of 10 and people like those numbers. So I put that in and I'm gonna be talking in the timeless present uh, even Babunge, who would abhor my use of the timeless presence now that he has died, but whatever. Um, it's a tradition in philosophy that I, I can't get away from, unfortunately. So uh, this talk starts way back in my, uh, just before my undergraduate days. I was in Sejep and, and, and already interested in philosophy, and I attended my usual habit, preferred my, prefer, fulfilled my, my, uh, for lack of a better phrase, my my addiction, as my mother calls it these days, of buying books when I have the time and money to do so. So I was in chapters in downtown Montreal and already knew Dennett uh, by reputation because I already read The Mind's Eye um, and bought Consciousness Explained at the time, uh, 1996, about five years after that it had, start, had been released. I then did a lot of philosophy, computing, and psychology undergraduate courses that addressed the topics, even mentioning Dennett by name, and met Bunge eventually as part of that and took several classes with him uh, and met a critic, which was very important and also read Penrose and also 
uh, met, met Penrose as an undergraduate as it happens and, and saw him do his criticism in person and so on. And I've wanted to do this for years, explain what computational ideas are in the philosophy of mind for a long time. My MA in under Gary, Wed Gary Wedeking at, at UBC was on events. It's also part of this puzzle. And I learned a lot about computability theory from many, many different sources, including Nicholas Pippinger, Jeremy Avogad, and my own MA, later mentor at, at Carnegie Mellon, Wilfred Zieg, who you'll hear about. I'm not going to talk about consciousness, cognitive ethology, philosophy of biology, philosophy of language, or AI, which is the duplicate, the, the dual to this problem today. I'm using a music stand here, which is a bit unusual for me. So what's computability theory? Uh, you can approach this in many different ways. Um, my favorite way is through the, the lens of automata theory and the, th the theory of formal languages. This is how I first encountered it, in fact, and it's, and it's a formal discipline. Munge talks about it in passing in his work on metaphysics, which is interesting to me because that's how I think about it now. Um, but the presentation as such was actually how I first saw it, actually in a class on computability theory at UBC, uh, taught by Nicholas Pippinger, as I mentioned. Um, this is the most, in my view, the most beautiful way to present it because it is, because it is the, in fact, the most concrete. However, um, and it needs immediately to the church sharing thesis, the question about what you can compute and why. Do we have the right notion of computation, which I don't think comes out if you do another beautiful presentation in degree theory and that sort of thing. Like, for example, Jeremy Avogad presented at Carnegie Mellon. This is very, very important for other purposes, but it's not really relevant to philosophy of mind. It's very difficult to understand why a theory about the, the, the transfinite would have anything to do with human cognition. Whereas the theory of automata um, is about recognizing strings. You can think of those as representing anything in the world you want. And, you, and you, you, when you're analyzing a problem, you turn it into, can you build a machine in a specified way that has certain kinds of features that will then have, um, have the ability that you want, that you want, you want, want to postulate or understand or analyze in various ways. This is what Turing himself had done and what you'd expect if you were doing philosophy of mind, you'd expect that you'd, you would expect that somebody would, would postulate that, for example, a brain is a certain, certain kind of an automaton and that sort of thing, and that's how you'd approach the problem. Unfortunately, and, and this is sort of like in retrospect, as I realized when I encountered these ideas later, there's nothing like this whatsoever in Dennett's Consciousness Explained, nor really in any of the other, other books that he's addressed the question in. This is very interesting to me, and it's very interesting to figure out why. Um, and I regard this as sort of a, we take this as given almost, that, that the actual automata theoretic version, even, or even the recursion theoretic version, as already, that part of why you'd want to do that has already been taken care of and by the work of Hilary Putnam as it happens. So what do you, what does one encounter instead? It's not, it, it's, it's, you encounter a whole lot of other things in Consciousness Explained that are, in my view, and this is where it becomes very interesting engaging with the critics, impossible to make use of unless one actually has the ambient computa uh, theory computation, because otherwise they don't, what are they, what, are they metaphorical, what are they referring to, and so on. So the most important one of these ideas in Dennett's work, as far as I'm concerned, for the, in the philosophy of mind anyway, is the notion of virtual machine. Because it's, in, it's, it's, actually, it's actually central to what Alan Turing himself does in 1930, the, the apical paper that starts the discipline at all, 1936. Notice this is before there are any computational devices as we understand them today. There are mechanical desk calculators and there are people like Blaise Pascal, even hundreds of years before, making what we'd call mechanical calculators. But the programmable notion, the idea that you could actually build a, a machine that, it may say, simulates others, is only, in, is only invented in 1936. Uh, about eight, eight or nine years before there were such physical machines. And so the virtual machine is the idea that you can, you can make a machine that is made, made out of other machines by m m having their state represent in some sense others. Uh, the other notion that Dennett makes like a lot of use of that's very important is the notion of serial versus parallel. Understand, he, he says you can't understand consciousness unless you understand it as a serial virtual machine implemented on a parallel hardware. Well, that's sure or not, we can talk about some other time, but it's a, that, that, that thesis is computational in the core, the core. Similarly, he borrows the notion of the demon back from computing. It's interesting there because the, the notion of a demon in this sense is like the demon in Unix, for those of you who've done operating systems, look at that. 
Um, but it's borrowed, it's borrowed back into psychology and philosophy of mind because the original notion was actually in an understanding uh, a human. Or, so it's there and back again. And on that, many, many other notions he makes use of. Here's a list from the... From the uh, from the that uh, one can one can analyze when one can tease out of his list of good ideas and from con reading consciousness explained in a cursory way and all kinds of other things. So, homunculi, adders, subtractors, register machine, buffer algorithm, etc. Um, subroutine search engine, collision detection software, made up information. I put that in quotation marks because it sort of runs together, sort of one notion. Uh, information by itself is not useful, so I, I concatenate it with the others. Digitization, random number generator, bandwidth generating tests, contention scheduling, data structure, production systems, um, data, uh, baud rate, bit mapping, frame problem, real time, bottom up, top down. The danger of computational ideas is because they're, they're some, you know, say substance free, is that one actually just writes a bunch of boxes and doesn't actually explain anything. Um, for example, his critic, Mary Bunge would ac accuses Dennett explicitly of this boxology here. This is Bunge about 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 the age when I knew him, when he was about eighty, he died a year or two ago at, at one hundred. So he, he has three criticisms of invoking computational ideas, like the ones I've alluded to. We can analyze those in detail later and why I think Dennett, explore why Dennett thinks they're applicable. But the, the point is that there are critics to these ideas. There are critics to even the idea that you want to bother introducing these. So the, the three are here. On the, the nature of idealizations and the Turing machine model, what they are and so on. The notion of programmability is actually very interesting. And what the notion, what are computational machines anyway? Are the, the take it of the three critic. So th we'll take these in order. Um, the first of these I encountered when preparing for my paper on AI that I wrote for Bungay's first class when I was an undergraduate. Objection to AI, objection, objection to computational theory of mind, both apply here. And the question is the, 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 the model of computation that we talked about earlier. The automata theoretic approach is the best way to get into this because this is exactly where it comes from. The other analysis requires the earlier the, the, the machine model. So what's a Turing machine? Well, it has a bunch of, it's discrete is the most important thing that Bungay draws attention to. This is the only, this is the only objection that he raises that has not actually been addressed in the literature at all. Um, it's just taken for granted that amongst others, including Dennett, that continuity in the nervous, nervous system is irrelevant. He makes, an obje makes a very strong objection to Turing machine idealizations of, con of cognition because they're, they involve a discrete set of states. This stuff is co-authored with a Colombian a psychologist, Ruben Ardila, who I should mention because it's important to mention all the sources. This is not a this is not a complaint that we are in some sense hyper computational. This is a complaint that we're non computational. And if you go and read this, if you go and actually try and read the whether or not this objection makes any difference to people actually studying computation, as I did after the fact, studying Turing, Turing addresses it as it happens. And the computer architecture literature, which is where you think you'd find this address in the concepts of things that people regard as art computational artifacts. It's not mentioned in the slightest. No one seems to care at all that there's an idealization made, made here that may not be suitable. Because it applies there too. There are, there are continuous voltages and so on in, real, in what are uncontentiously computers. Um, Bunge's other objection is, is, is addressed by Dennett, is the question of programmability. The client, you work by running an argument to the effect of that, this, or this or that computer cognitive uh, feature of humans or others, emotions, whatnot, is, is non-computational because it cannot be programmed. And hence also computational theory minds are false. But what's an algorithm? What's programmability? We'll get to more of that with Penrose, but uh, there's a difference. This, this is where I, I would love to have the debate again with the now deceased mentor because there are distinctions here that are very, very important to computing people. The miller robin pollard primality test is a probabilistic test for primality. It determines whether the number is prime as a guess, and it can be wrong. So are we, does that, that, is that computational notion appropriate? He would also claim that the notion of algorithm and heuristic is now instance relative. The, 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 the um, 
MRP test is a perfectly good algorithm for something else. It guarantees a solution for some other problem, but not for what you want it for in our case, which is testing for primes. So is that a question of realism? I don't know. And Dennett would say the realistic answer is that there is no realistic answer. Oops. Uh, Bungay's argument, third argument on computational machines continues the notion on you can't program that. Dennett's remark that not everything in a computer, using a computer, is, is programmed is ab absolutely right here, as far as I'm concerned. However, Bungay already had preemptively answers that. It's all computable in the sense of computability theory already. It has to be, by, for deep metaphysical reasons, as I, he and I would agree on. However, <laughs> uh, the very interesting thing is when this is pressed, I ask, I even asked him in person aloud in class, um, Wittgenstein's question about do calculating machines calculate? And his answer is actually no. And that's where the, I think the most fundamental disagreement between Bungay and I and, De and, and Dennett would be as well. But Dennett would agree with me and not with Bungay for sure. Calculating machines, computers calculate in a very, re in a re in any, as much as anything else. If you don't think that at all, if you do, as Bungay does, and has his ne one of his nemesis, ironically, putting him dialogue with Wittgenstein here is very interesting here. And the question as to why he would think there are actually no computational machines in any real sense, taking strictly speaking, there aren't any, has to do with the nature of idealizations, which we talked about uh, talked about earlier. Which leads me to Penrose, because Penrose shares some of the concerns that Bunge shares. Here's him, I think he's winning the Nobel Prize here. Uh, so he, he criticizes the computational theory of mind and artificial intelligence through, through parallel but distinct approaches. Oops. So Penrose makes use of Goodall's incompleteness theorems, which are, this is Goodall as a young man on the, on the slide here proved the famous theorem that um, any sufficiently complicated theory, complex theory of arithmetic is, if consistent and suitably axiomatized, unable to prove either of P or not P for some suitable statement P, i.e. something that looks arithmetical but has not, cannot be proved within that. Penrose thinks, therefore, that a computing machine to prove this theorem as applies to its own formal system, et cetera, and come to it the way a human can, is that hence impossible. I am not provable in system as versus I am, provided S is not consistent, I am proven to S as S is where this falls down. Unfortunately, this is where Dennett would correct him. Like all the logicians on, have correct, it's amazing that you have to have mathematicians correct a fellow mathematician here. But the theorem is not, unfortunately not what Douglas Hofstadter, my one another, my, my heroes says. It's not, I am not, I'm pr not provable in system S. It says provided S is consistent, I am not provable in S. And that's a big assumption. As we see here, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, assume that we can see the truth that the system is consistent and then hence detach the consequent by a ba basic logical inference. This requires the entire mathematical community to be in some sense mathematically sound. There's no way, possibility of error because otherwise we are, in, we are inconsistent. Uh, and then hence we cannot detach the consequent to see the truth of the twelve sentence. That seems unlikely. Uh, to say the least. How does this work even? How would that work? What, what's, what's the mechanism by which we are non-computable? Penrose goes on to try to explain it. He appeals to microtubules and cells because may, just maybe the biophysics will allow this to be non-computable. This is insane to be brought. Uh, Bungay came to the philosophy department colloquial when Penrose presented this idea. They are both, in a way, both physicists. This, he was just... <laughs> almost laughing out loud at this part of the idea. I tend to agree. Those of you who remember Bick Stenger uh, and my work with him, if you want to call it that, or my friendship with him online, uh, this is how I encountered Stenger for the first time, criticizing Penrose. Uh, the physics here is it's just, you can do the calculations, Stenger, you can look it up. It's just, it doesn't make any sense at all. This, even if this were true, however, it's explaining the unknown at best, appealing to the just it might be something new here, new physics in the brain here. Because notice Penrose, unlike Bungay, thinks that, the, that, that all of contemporary physics is computable. So he has to look somewhere else to find it, to find the non-computable thing that he found. 
that he thinks is necessary. He's so wedded to the idea that we're non-computational that he has to go on and postulate that there must be something new uh, that we haven't discovered in, in, in a wet, warm, <laughs> slow system that, <laughs> as Dan and others pointed out, this is just, this is off the wall. This is, this is, you'd have to do a lot more than that to convince us. So I've met some, I've, I've introduced you to some computational ideas, just sort of alluded to them in passing, showing what, why they matter. We can talk more about any one of those in the Q&A if you wish, or anything else. Uh, and some of the features, why you actually appeal to. You appeal to these other things. That's the important thing about the computational theory of mind. You get access to these other resources to understand cognition, edge detection. How do you understand us understanding where this a boundary between the fireplace in front of me and the wall behind it? How do I see that if I don't appeal to something called an edge detector? The only way I can understand an edge detector is in computational terms. And trying to understand where that ends in you and something else begins, what Bungay and Penrose would have said, is their task. And in my view, it just it simply doesn't end. We're computationally all the way down, and all the way in. I've discussed briefly how Bungay and, and answered it briefly on Dennett's behalf. I have now exposed you to some, some more or less scientifically friendly, though not very, to be honest, uh, speculation of Penrose. The mathematical logic is correct almost, and hence it's more friendly than the stuff about the microtubules and the biophysics, but whatever we can, it's unlike some critics which just try to gain, say, the whole idea by just saying can't, can't possibly, and don't explain why, whereas Bunke tries to tell you why something is not programmable and fails, which is actually what you want. Uh, lessons on programming from somebody who never, who never programmed in his life, as he admitted to me, I might say. <laughs> uh, so that's that. I'm happy, I'm happy to take any questions. I lived, literally left this very, very open-ended so that this, this can be anything at all on the topic or the can be addressed. I have done, prepared for any number of answers to any number of questions, though hopefully I get one I've never heard before. So please go ahead with any. So uh, um, I, um, I can, ask a question that just came in to me uh, rather than passing it through Brenda, if that's good with you, Brenda. Sure, absolutely fine, Shauna, thank you. So, so yeah, so um, it's about um, in integrated information theory. Um, and uh, um, so um, if, if, you, um, if you can uh, um, talk about how that relates to, uh, to the, the three, uh, um, your, your three examples. You'll have to tell me what it is. I don't know. What that... Okay. Uh, um, th there's a, there's another question, um, and uh, while while I I will type a little bit about integrated information theory. I can read it to you if you'd like. Yeah, please do. It's probably for the best for the. The comment comes from uh, Dave McDonald that Penrose was has admitted he doesn't necessarily buy orc, O R but just ran it up proverbial flagpole. If you can stomach Joe Rogan, his podcast with Penrose is enlightening. Okay. Um, the question about is about the, the, the mechanism, the collapse mechanism that he thinks is a problem. I um, Digressing into that, just too, just too much philosophy of physics, but long story short is I think you can do everything with decoherence. And you don't, you don't have to worry about that the, 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 there's no through Andrew Villikin and others, you can actually, you don't have to worry about the problem he is trying to solve in the foundation of physics by postulating that. As for Rogan, frankly, don't care, but okay. Uh, it's in, this, in the sense that I, I he, he's been, Penrose has been on about this stuff for a long, long, long time, as you can see. So um, the, the, the foundations of physics, the extent that I have followed it has moved on. So you have, so the question about so do you need do you need it do you need the do you need to solve the two mysteries at once? Well, you're now you're now down to one and a half of them at best. <laughs> uh, it has nothing to do with the philosophy of mind. You don't have to worry about it at all in the in the in the context of what in the context of the, what what then it would tell you and Bungay would also tell you and to, to solve the problems the, the problems of of how we think, you don't need to worry about quantum mechanics ever. Thank you for your response, Keith. That's uh, 
It's always very, always very interesting to me. It's almost, it's almost a theorem. You can, you can almost. That's basically what what Rick Rush and Pat, Pat Churchling did, and what Vic Stenger did independently. You can basically do the. Yeah. You can basically run the numbers and show that there's we're too hot, we're too hot and too wet. Not, not, there's no quantum, there's no quantum mystery here at all. I have an additional question, uh, Keith. Um, it asks that um, could you talk a little more about the role of the super Turing machine model hyper computation for the possibility of consciousness? Uh, okay, um, this is a bit more on topic. This is actually my MS thesis was on analyzing one particular model of computa hyper computation. Um, I don't think you need it in, in, in the sense that you, what, what it, problems become very, very strange. This is where I, this is where I would have loved to have another conversation with Bungay because if you assume it's very difficult to tease apart the difference between non-computational hyper here. But if you, if you think of the, 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 the non as being infinitely high on the arithmetic hierarchy, then you get the same problems again. You get, you get, you get a, so I'll, I'll assume that that's where the, where the, where we can, where we can analyze the problem. So in other words, um, do we have, what kinds of problems arise if you assume we're hyper computational or anything is hyper computational? You have to have a model of hyper computation for which that seems at all plausible. The best one I know is the one that is subject to my MS thesis is the, is the work of Ava Siegelman, uh, in her 1997 book, Beyond, uh, Computing Beyond the Turing Limit or something to that effect. I can provide references to people who care later if you want. Uh, anyway, you can find my stuff on it very easily. It's all online. Um, long story short is you need perfect analog. This is the most plausible hypercomputational model in the literature. Perfect analog, as she herself proves, is, is, is vulnerable to the, the slightest bit of noise. And the funniest thing is, as she herself proves, you get a non-Turing model back. You get a, a sub-Turing model. You get a finite automaton for those who know the literature back. So you lose the ability to even idealize us as a Turing machine if you adopt, paradoxically, adopt a stronger model. And that sounds to me like, why would you bother? Does it solve any interesting problems? Well, you'll have to convince me that we can we can solve a, a, super, a super Turing problem. And notice you, this requires, it appears, to it, to solve all infinity of, of cases of a of a problem. There are no, I do not know of any problems that you can actually adequately represent as a as a solvable problem in the sense of uh, the the formal theory of you would say problem questions and answers. The problem the, the formal theory of 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 learning. Kevin Kelly at Carnegie Mellon, who I knew was into this stuff. There's only there's only the only problems that there are the, the, the you might say the limiting cases of a sequence of other problems. So can we solve all of these in every case in a uniform way? Is what you'd have to say. Unlikely at best. So there's nothing there's nothing for you don't, a theory of consciousness or anything else does not need any hypercomputational ideas because there's no because there's no need they don't solve any problems. There's no open there's no open there's no question with which they would solve. There are lots of problems that look hypercomputational. Somewhere brings yard has a whole lot of them, but they're all you can solve any instances of them. Any finite number of instances can be solved by by a, by a, an idealized Turing machine or anything else like it. So you don't you don't need the hypercomputational idea at all. I explored the ideas in my MS because I thought, uh, what is the point behind these explorations? What could it possibly be the case that there's something that that is that is hypercomputational? And the answer is. No, and you probably don't need it anyway, for that reason. There are less plausible models, by the way. If we're, if we're, there's a whole taxonomy of the of hyper computational models, but that's. Thank the you very much for that, Keith. That was great. Thank you for uh, addressing that question. Um, I believe at this time that is all the questions we have. I think and, uh, Brenda, I saw a question that oh. came in um, through the through the chat. So if I could ask the person who posted the question in the uh, Discord chat to post it on the Zoom chat, so we can see oh. it. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you. I can actually read that question to you, Keith. The question is. Um, what are alternative theories of consciousness that do not presuppose the existence of minds or computation? There's lots of theories of consciousnesses that are non-computational. Uh, Bunge has one to himself. Um, 
Galen Strawson has the, is the arch anti Dennett in his mental reality, trying to understand what, why Galen Strawson, and I, I say Galen here because there are two philosopher Strawsons, Pierre Fils, and Galen is the one who's written this mental reality book a couple of years ago. Mental reality is just a travesty. It doesn't understand Dennett at all. Uh, however, it's non computate It's it claims to be naturalistic. It's not. It require it re again appeals to spooky powers. <laughs> I can poison them all by saying it. But you can read it yourself. You can you can try to understand what he's on about. It's again it's what I would call a gainsaying. You get people who think that you don't need to worry about some of the details of implementation at all, like Jake on Kim, who famously in an interview I saw just before he died, claimed that you do not need to understand anything about how brains work to understand how we think and do philosophy of mind. This is incredible. He thinks he can do everything by, he's in a way a, a dual to Penrose because Penrose thinks he can solve the problem by appealing to purely to physics. Whereas, or at least thought as it was in the nineties, whereas Kim says you can just, you can, you can, you can get, as he puts it, physicalism or near enough by simply analyzing um, supervenience relations and such things. I'm like Bunga, I don't buy the supervenience relations in the literature, so they're not, exciting. If you want to understand what Kim, where I think Kim goes wrong, read the entire book that I mentioned, Physical Number Near Enough, and replace everywhere he talks about um, psychology, replace it with chemistry and see whether he's special pleading, right? Um, I think he's more or less in the right place, but he's, he doesn't engage with the scientific literature at all, which I regard as, as a, if I can put it that way, this way, a cardinal sin, if you're doing any serious philosophy understand what other people are doing in the same area that overlaps with your domain. And Kim denies that. That's just crazy as far as I'm concerned. But what do you do? Um, there are lots of people who would, who would appeal to, to gain, say, the idea that you can appeal to Turing machine models because of they don't understand computation in the theory of computation in general. It looks too ridiculous, you know, a bunch of tape and that sort of thing. Well, it's just a that's a that's didactic in a way that gets you gets you the the state transitions you want. So there's lots of those. There's lots of attempts to do understand and I, and I I don't regard the problem of like Dennett, I do not regard the problem of consciousness as the interesting problem. No, uh, that's the that's it's in what I would regard I, at the very least you have to solve other more interesting problems first, and then worry, if there's anything left then worry about worry about the worry about the worry worry the worry about the residual at each stage. And at this stage, I don't regard them as being one. And I can explain why. It's much, I would agree with much with Dennett. Run his thought experiments. Take the arguments extremely seriously because I, I agree with him. People say they just, they just gainsay them. They don't actually try them out. All right. um, that's, a, that's the short answer. That's, 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 that's dogmatically presented, but that's the, what I would encourage you to do. My, most, my famous, most famous version of those is Consciousness Explained has the thought experiment with a playing card. Uh, do it. And if you're still convinced that you understand how you how you actually perceive, and that doesn't confuse the hell out of you, it does it to me every time. And I know what the results are. Now, draw a playing card from a deck of playing cards and hold it arm's length to your right, to, to your left. Tell you see, and ha your and your your visual system, if you look straight ahead, will insist that you're seeing motion without a moving object. You'll see, and that's understanding why that's the case is part. Is the way in as far as I'm concerned. If, if you can understand, if you can understand why that's important, you're now on your way to understanding what Dennett's all about. Which is not to say I agree with him about everything, uh, even in the, even in philosophy of mind. I don't. It's just that no, I think you have to start with his thought experiment, the thought actual demonstration rather than thought experiment. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, that's it was really interesting to listen to the information and, and your addressing of the questions was tremendous. Um, we want to thank you very much for sharing with us today generously and presenting. Mm -hmm.